Okay, why don't we go ahead and get started. Uh, my the last lecture, so it's always a nice one for me to give. Um, so this one is just a very short 15 minute lecture about voxel-based uh, morphometry analysis, also known as uh, VBM. Um, so VBM um, is a very prominent uh, analysis technique for analyzing uh, morphometry. Um, probably more than FreeSurfer. Right? It's a tool that's available in both SBM and FSL, um, and you know it's pretty it's pretty easy to use and it's pretty fast. So um, a lot of people have used it to do morphometric analysis. So we often get questions in the class or on the FreeSurfer list about like you know what's the what are how do these two compare? What is VBM? How does it compare to surface-based analysis? So this talk is, is all about that. So I have a very, very short introduction as to what VBM is, just to try to give you a sense for what it is it's measuring, because it's not always so obvious. Um, so here are two um, volumes here, one for an 88-year-old subject and one for a 19-year-old subject. And you can just look at these and see that you know there's a lot of differences, you know, much bigger ventricles than in the younger one and the, um, the uh, intersocal space appears to be much different uh, so you can't really see like the space in the, between the sulci uh, very well for the young subject and if you do a, um, a tissue type segmentation so you have gray matter here, white matter here and cerebral spinal fluid here um, again, you can start to see some differences here in that you know, the older subject tends to have less gray matter, um, and it tends to have more uh, less white matter, and it tends to have more uh, CSF. Um, so the question comes and like how do you how can you look at these things and come to some kind of conclusion? You know, a lot of people have, have come up to me and said, okay, I know how to do thickness-based analysis in free surfer. Uh, how do I do a, like a volume-based morphometry analysis? And in FreeSurfer, really, that's just a question of getting uh, one value for hippocampal volume, one value for putamen volume, uh, and you're not looking at a map, you're just getting these values for these regions of interest. So this is looking at how do you create maps of change of, uh, say, gray matter. Um, and so one question that comes in here, how do you define a volume without defining a boundary? You know, if you're looking at, at, uh, at hippocampus um, or you're looking at something like cortex, um, there might be some regions that are uh, becoming smaller uh, in there, but other regions that aren't. And so how do you go about um, uh, comparing that on a voxel-wise basis? So um, created another little cartoon, because I like cartoons. And uh, this one are, is this little um, uh, uh, face here with uh, two eyes and a mouth for subject one. And target two, uh, subject two has two eyes and a mouth, but the eyes are closer together and the mouth has this kind of half smile and the lips are thicker on one side. And so, um, we can use a nonlinear spatial normalization to warp subject one into subject two. And so, you know, what I have to do is take subject one's eyes and move them together. And I have to take uh, subject one's mouth and curl it up. And I have to take the lips on one side and uh, make them uh, thicker. So if I keep track of these things, um, so like, you know, if I if I take this little voxel here on the left side of the mouth and keep track of where that voxel ends up after the warping, you can see that that voxel doesn't change any size. It has uh, you know one millimeter by one millimeter, or still one millimeter by one millimeter. Um, but this red voxel, I actually have to uh, increase the size of it a little bit, and the orange one even more, and the yellow one even more. So. These voxels, I have to, to change the, uh, the location because the lip is curling up, but the lip is also thickening, so I have to change the size of this, uh, of this voxel. So 
relative, like if I th if I think of this not as a as a smiley face, but as uh, as gray matter, uh, then to warp subject one into subject two, I have to take the small voxel and make it really really big, um, and so that implies that if this is gray matter, I have less gray matter in subject one that has this small uh, square compared to subject two where the equivalent is this big square. So there's more gray matter in this big yellow square over here than there is in this uh, little yellow square there. And so you can do this continuously um, to keep track of how big uh, these squares come uh, by using this term called the Jacobian. Uh, this is just a measure of the warping that you have to go through, the amount of stretching or compression um, that you need in order to uh, map one subject to another. So here, uh, the mouth ends up getting warped a lot more on the right side than on the left side. And the eyes, since the eyes aren't changing shape, they're changing position, but they're not changing size, uh, there is no Jacobian there. The Jacobian is zero there. So then the way that uh, VBM works is that you take your individual T1 map and you have a target like the MNI 152 and you go through a spatial normalization to try to register them uh, as well as you can. So this is this subject with these big huge ventricles uh, mapped into this MNI 152 space uh, here. And so uh, you can see, like as I said before, the ventricles have to get compressed and so if you look at the Jacobian map, you see the ventricles are all blue, which means compression. Uh, and there's some other places where you had to have some compression as well. And then the red places are where you had to have expansion to fit into uh, this template. And so you get the, uh, the tissue type segmentation here uh, inside of the M and I space. And so what you do is you take the gray matter segmentation. So this gray matter segmentation is a soft segmentation. It's a number between zero and one, indicating how much gray matter is in that voxel. And then you multiply it by this Jacobian to get something that's referred to as gray matter density. And this density term uh, is important because it's a little bit difficult to interpret. But nevertheless, you, have, you compute this gray matter density, and then you apply a 3D smoothing kernel to it to get your final measure. And so you do that for your, all of your group. So you have a gray matter density for every subject in MNI space. And then for each vertex, you can do our same trick here, where you can draw horizontal axis is age and vertical axis is gray matter density. And each dot is a gray matter density for a subject. And then you can do the same GLM trick that we've been doing all week long, where you, uh, you fit the gray matter density uh, to age in a linear regression. When you do that at every voxel, you see all of this uh, stuff. Uh, so this is looking at gray matter density, where it, uh, in blue is where gray matter density is dropping with age, and in red is where it uh, tends to be increasing with age. Uh, so that's basically how you do a VBM study. And so um, I'll review the surface-based analysis uh, very quickly, even though you've been doing it all week long. This actually serves as a pretty good uh, review for you. So with surface-based analysis, we define a white surface, we define a peel surface, which is red here, and then the distance between those two is the thickness which we can construct onto a map. You know, and when you look at um, the, the changes in the thickness with age, you know, here's this image that you've seen a million times already where you have nice, young, plump uh, you know, cortex for an 18-year-old. And then as you get older, you see a lot more red because it's, uh, it's thinning. And um, you know, you've seen uh, this map before where you can take that surface and you can map it uh, to FS average through the surface-based registration. And uh, you can, you, so you've seen this one before as well. This is like Free Surfer class greatest hits slides. Um, so you've seen this one, you can smooth uh, along the surface. 
and then you do the same the same thing where you have uh, a map in this common space of the thickness and then at every point you can create one of these uh, scatter plots and fit age against thickness and again you see all of this blue indicating that thickness is, um, is dropping with age the, the cortex thins so in some ways the VBM and thickness are telling a similar thing so this is uh, the VBM map that I showed you earlier and uh, what I did was I just took the VBM map and I mapped it onto the surface so we could compare um, vertex for vertex, area for area on the inflated surface between VBM and thickness. And so you can see that there's a lot of similarities, lots of blue, you know, that's the bad news. As you get older, you lose tissue, right? Uh, this is gray matter density, this is thickness. Uh, but you can also start to see some differences as well. This has some area here where, uh, you know, you don't see it there. Um, Thickness-based study, you see this really prominent change in uh, the visual cortex here that you don't see anything at all in the, in the VBM study. Uh, VBM also has this large area here in this in inferior frontal area where everything is going positive, uh, like it's getting thicker or more, more dense uh, with age and you see almost nothing of that in in the thickness based study so you know there're definitely going to be some uh, some differences and the question arises like where do these differences come from so um, there's several places uh, where things can go wrong with with VBM uh, so one is this um, uh, this idea of density that becomes kind of hard to interpret because density is this strange mixture of thickness and surface area and dryification and registration and smoothing and intensity and you kind of don't really know which one of these or which combination of these is causing an effect. So one of the interesting things is with um, intensity that as you um, what it's trying to do is to say, um, you know, based upon the intensity of the T1, I'm going to assign a number between 0 and 1, uh, which is the amount of gray matter that is there. So if you look at something like uh, pallidum, pallidum is very, very um, bright on a T1 weighted image. And VBM will say, OK, my density there is like 0.5. And right next to it, putamen, uh, which is um, uh, considerably darker, but still brighter than the rest of cortex, is going to be uh, 0.75. Uh, so you, you can get these changes, like with disease, you can get these changes in intensity. Like I was just looking at uh, this one study um, where they were looking at genetics of something that affected putamen and it caused the putamen to take up iron a little bit more than a normal subject would. So this group went off and did a VBM study and they said the volume of putamen is changing because the gray matter density was different. But the reality was is that the volume of putamen wasn't changing. The putamen was uh, pulling in uh, more iron that was causing it to be darker on the T1 and the uh, VBM said there's there's more gray matter there because it's now darker and so that led to this mistaken conclusion that the volume of VBM was actually or the volume of putamen was actually changing when it really wasn't um, another thing another problem is uh, dryification so here's our young subject here is our old subject and what you can see is that the older subject has a lot of space uh, between the gyri. The, the socal space has expanded dramatically. And so what that means, if you were to, to go and say, you know, put a, a dot at some place here and draw a circle around it and ask, ask how much gray matter was in that, inside of that circle, which is kind of what VBM is doing, uh, you would come up with one number for the young subject. If you did the same thing for the older subject, you would find that there's a lot less gray matter around that dot because the sulcal space has opened up a lot. 
Um, but the thickness of that area might not have changed at all. So part of what you're measuring with VBM is this gyrification. The if the sulcal space is opening up, it can cause the gray matter density to be less, even though there might not be any changes to gray matter at all. So I think this is a real weakness to VBM is that the interpretability. You know, it's telling you something, and that something might be interesting, but it, it just becomes very, very hard to uh, interpret. Um, on the plus side, VBM allows for subcortical analysis in this morphometric kind of way, which you, which you can't do inside of uh, FreeSurfer. So which one is better? You know, I've probably given away my bias as to, as to which one is better. Uh, but it's still really an open question. You, st you still see, like, you know, probably more VBM studies than you do thickness studies because it's uh, very easy to use, it's fast, and, um, you know, and it's in, in SPM and FSL, and people can just press buttons, and, and they get all their results from it. Um, so if you're interested in uh, VBM, there's several places where you can go and get it. As I said, SPM has a has uh, several variants of VBM by now, and FSL also has it. Um, so that's it. Thanks.